Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. I'm Mike Zenker, and I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Growing in Grace Ministries Canada and Hope Fellowship, your community church, invite you to enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. Good morning and welcome to Still Growing in Grace. Glad you're taking time to join me today. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful uh, conversation today. It's called Healing Our Image of God. And I think as I wrote in the description, um, some of our descriptions that we've been given or handed down to us of who God is, uh, at best, they're all incomplete. At worst, they're wrong or brutally skewed. Um, and there's so much more to learn. And I have a hunch because I personally believe that everybody lives their lives based on their concept of who they think God is. Everybody. If he doesn't exist, you live like it. If you think he's angry, you live like it. If he's all merciful and gracious, you live like it. Everybody does. So I think there, there's room for much healing of our image of who we think God is. And this conversation is going to be really good. So we got Richard Murray, Bill Thrasher, Fred Young, and Randy Elstrott. Um, this is this is just going to be delightful. So I'm going to dive right in and let you enjoy this. I'm watching live with you, so make sure you comment, tell me where you're watching from, and uh, let's dig into this very, very encouraging conversation. Here we go. Sounds good. All right, welcome to Still Growing in Grace, and I think today's topic, uh, for most of those that tend to watch Still Growing in Grace or uh, podcasts, uh, video conversations like this, uh, this is a, a re reoccurring theme. Um, but today we want to talk about uh, healing our image of God. Um, and that has many tentacles in it. So I'm going to just go around the, the Hollywood squares here and ask each of you, um, what has been a, an image of God that has been needed to be healed uh, in your past or around people that you know? And then we'll jump into uh, how to redeem or fix or... Um, find more hope-filled perspectives on our image of God. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to start with Randy. Randy, um, put you on the spot. Ha <laughs> um, ha. Yeah. But uh, you've written a book about this, so this should come easy to you. But uh, an image of God, even if we duplicate it, who cares? Like if you guys repeat it and so what? It, this is about where we're at right now, real with the people we're connected to today, the stuff we're seeing or pretty obvious ones we've had to unlearn. So let's start with you. Well, it's a it's a it's a great question, and uh, I think in in my in my life I had, and I don't know where I got this image of God, but somehow I had in my head an image of an angry God, uh, and uh, I think that to to put a fine point on it, if you if anybody saw the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail, there's they they portray the father. You know, he's it's a cartoon character, but he's this angry curmudgeon, uh, you know, white hair, white beard, kind of looks like me, really. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, very angry, got this attitude going in. And that in, in my heart, somehow growing up, I took that on as you know, not that not that that had any influence really on my <laughs> image of the father. But for whatever reason, I picked up an image of the father that was like that. And of course. I, you know, honestly, the scripture kind of backs that up. If you're, you know, if you're paying much attention to, you know, much of the Old Testament and even here and there in the New Testament. Um, so so that was the image that needed to be healed in me. You know, it was it's funny because that was I don't know if it's a difference between my heart and my head or or, or it was almost like there was a battle inside of me and I could tell that there was a spirit that was saying that's not true, but this is what I felt. And actually, to be honest, I still may battle with that at times, yep. that there's this, this image tries to rise up and say that, you know, this is what God is like, or God's not happy with this and or, or that. But but it's it's the spirit of God that's in me that, that I recognize now that that's exactly what I'm hearing, uh, that's insisting, no, that that's not who he is. That's not what he looks like. Uh, so, uh, so to answer your question, that is, 
that is one of the images, at least I should say, or maybe the main image that I needed to shake from, from my life is the image of an, an angry old curmudgeon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good one, Bill. Yeah. Um, I, I had some of the same one, obviously growing up in Southern Baptist church in the deep South Atlanta, right? You, you, you can't help but to get kind of the, uh, hellfire and brimstone type image of the father. But I think for the point of this conversation, one of the the ones that I really want to highlight was probably my last area of recalibration around the idea of the Godhead. And I am a staunch Trinitarian. Um, I believe that, you know, the three parts of God and one, the paradox that that is this kind of, you know, concept, this this. I don't, I don't even know how to articulate it. This, this idea, this, um, this something that we can't really latch on to, but we just have to have faith in and believe in that we have the father, the son, and the Holy spirit. Obviously Jesus began to refine and um, reshape how I understood the father. And then ultimately how I understood the spirit mm. and the idea that Holy spirit is this convicting force. And there's some even words in, that have been interpreted in uh, the, New, the New Testament that kind of try to back that up. And I think there's a misapplication to the translations there. That's not maybe for this topic of discussion. But the more I've kind of delved in that, just like Jesus is the exact representation of God for the Father, so too is that for the Spirit. And the Spirit that indwells, Spirit of Christ indwelled within me has to look and sound exactly like Jesus too. And that spirit is not one of condemnation. That There is no condemnation for those in Christ, right? So when I have a, a sense of, you know, convictedness, and I use that word really specifically because convict is the root word of someone who breaks the law and who is to be held at with punishment, right, against the law. And conviction is a conviction or a convict against that law. That is not how Jesus operated in any way, shape, or form. And so for Holy Spirit to become this gracious, enlightening um, force of goodness and comfort, the comforter, and to reinforce that I am inseparably one with, with the Father— despite my own human junk, that that is the root of my identity and will be always the one, she will always be the one who reinforces that in my soul was a huge paradigm shift for me. And I think that's, that's a, a, an element of healing my image of God. The Holy Spirit's not the little angel on the shoulder saying, don't do that. I'm going to be mad if you do that. Um, that Holy Spirit is the Jesus on my shoulder speaking the exact words of Christ over me. Okay. That's a good image to unlearn. I like that. And almost got into some answers. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> that's good. No, that's good. Uh, Richard. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little different than you guys because I was not indoctrinated. We know with... you're different. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a weirdo. No, but just now I didn't come to the Lord till I was 28. So by the time I came to the Lord, I, I wasn't indoctrinated. I mean, I maybe went to church four or five times my entire life prior to that. So I'm sure that I had heard the wrathful image of God and had had, had it. But um, when I came to the Lord, the, the immediate uh, image that I drew was sort of like my dad. It was connected to my dad. And I had a great dad. And I had a heroic dad and I had a generous dad. He, wa he wasn't perfect, but uh, no matter how bad my situations were growing up, my dad was always by my side and it always ended up okay. I knew that he was going to fix it in the end, you know, and that was, uh, you know, when I hear people struggle with an image of God because of maybe their dad not being there for them or whatever, it, it breaks my heart, but it makes me also just very appreciative that, uh, you know, that my dad was there modeling the, the fatherhood of God. And so for me, and I'm not saying that I didn't have natural wrath and natural, you know, some natural distortion and was projecting onto God my own anger. So my distortions would come more probably 
from me being mad at somebody or mad at a group or mad at an idea or mad at a circumstance and then trying to call God's wrath down on it because I was wrathful, you know, mm-hmm. but in, in that situation, I was just projecting and, you know, God brought me um, through all that to a, to a place um, maybe, I guess it was uh, six years, maybe five years after I came, uh, came to the Lord. Uh, I, I had, and I think I've shared it before, but I had an experience at the Toronto revival where God, the image of God was revealed as, uh, my, as, as my wrestling coach, God went back in my memory and pulled out an emotional memory. Cause I was very close to my wrestling coach. Uh, cause I, I grew up really overweight and I was heavy and I was made fun of a lot. And then when I went to high school, I kind of slimmed up overnight and my wrestling coach took me under my wing. And this was the first person I'd that it, other than my dad that had ever cared for me. So anyway, he became a special person in my life. And then the Lord went back in, this, in, in the revival and just showed me that that was him for me, you know, that that image was, was his love in my life. And I would have to say that image was the day I consciously, now before then I was kind of bouncing off with my dad, you know, my dad's image, but that was the image. That was the moment in, in my life that I crossed the river into a realization about God's nature that uh, it forever formed everything that came after it. Every word, you know, every decent word that I've written or every decent word that I've shared that's had any positive impact came, had come, sprung from that image of God as my wrestling coach. And, uh, you know, it's it's my, uh, you know, you talk about getting into answers, but gosh, I guess it's just my hope that everyone uh, can find uh, a touch point with God in their in their memories, in their experience. They, they, they can begin to transition them in, into this God is light and in, and in him is no darkness at all. Mm. So that was me. I didn't have to work through as much as I'm sure a lot of y'all did, uh, you know, growing up in it and around it and, and on that side of it. I just was uh, I was kind of like a lucky kid, the new kid on the block, you know, <laughs> in, in the whole yeah, thing. You are lucky. You really are. Yeah. All right, Fred. Uh, well, mine's uh, opposite of that because I was uh, in church um, as, a, as a baby in a fundamental, independent fundamental Baptist church. So uh, my image of God came a lot. I would say there's several things, but one of them was uh, the preachers. And the preachers, by the way, we had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night revivals. I started going to Christian school in seventh grade where we had chapel three times a week, plus all the church. Then I went to Bible college where it was all the church and all the chapels. I've listened to a lot of sermons, a lot of sermons. And uh, most, uh, most of them, most of them, majority of them were angry. And, um, and then the, throw in there a good chick track every now and then where the image of God is pretty angry. So um, I'm, I'm with Randy. I, I just, God was mad. Matter of fact, I, I did a, like I would try and it worked for me picture walking into an empty room where God was Mm. and pay attention to the emotion. And I didn't want to go in. Mm. And Mm. what I came to for me was he was disappointed in me. Wow. He was just really disappointed in me. And that hurt. That I didn't, I don't, you know, I didn't want to be, um, you know, let him down and be disappointed, but he, he had his arms folded and he was more judge than father. Mm-hmm. So I had to heal that, that healing. And I'm with Randy. I still, <laughs> you know, I can get drawn back in really easy and, and I have to really pray, talk to myself and, and uh, allow the Holy Spirit to go, wait a minute, uh, don't listen to that. And um, yeah, the healing part was um, God is like Jesus. And to be honest, I, I'm just being honest here. When I, when I got a hold of Richard's uh, material and uh, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I never paid attention to that verse. I've been a pastor for a long time. I really didn't pay attention to that verse. I really didn't. And I just, that verse is still to this day just uh, cleanses this idea, helps heal that idea. So that's kind of where, where, uh, where I came from. And it, it's mm. still a battle. 
I bet you we could do a whole podcast on all the verses we didn't see, <laughs> which is a yeah. good idea, actually. Yeah, it's good. Oh, yeah. Hey, hey can, can, can I share something real quick just about where we might go? I mean, just just because I, I, I wish I'd said it when I was talking a minute ago, but it, when Fred was talking, it just kind of popped up. You know, listening to us, there's really two issues here. One is the issue of the of the poor image of God we've been indoctrinated with. But the other one is the poor image of God that we carry in our own soul, mm-hmm. uh, yes. you know, in our own insecurities and in our own fears. And those mm-hmm. could be fat, affected by the indoctrination. Absolutely. But, but I think there's two things people need, uh, uh, you know, that we need to address at some point is, is how do we get unindoctrinated? And then how, how do we deal with our own insecurities in, in as far as they hurt our image of God or wounded our image of God? That's yeah, really I, good. I, I would agree. And on, on many levels, maybe I was unique. And I think we've talked about this uh, before at some, at some moments while I was immersed in the cultural Christian church and had a lot of that, you know, the, the language and the sermons around an angry God. I think I was unique in that. I, I don't think my soul image of God ever felt that way. My head image had that, but my soul image didn't. So I was, in a weird way, protected. My family, you know, we were in a Southern Baptist church. My dad was on staff. My parents drank wine and would hide it in the cabinet. And so there was always this kind of formalized legalism, but then there was this grace that I had in my house, just like you're saying, my, my dad didn't act like that. My mom didn't act like that. There was a superseding understanding of God that was better than what we were kind of placated to. Right. But, um, so, so I'm, I'm in total agreement that there was that my heart God. Now, for some people, I know that wasn't the case, but I, I was at least blessed to have a head God and a heart God, and they weren't always aligned. And when I heard Jesus is the exact representation of God, Hebrews 1, 3, one of the verses I've always ignored, um, that was my <laughs> moment of like, oh, and it just started to click. Um, and that changed everything for me 15 years ago or whatever. Yeah. I uh, I think like going to a doctor, the doctor will say you have an infection. So you call it what the problem is. Now let's deal with the problem. And I mm-hmm. think that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to deal with these these problems. And somebody's going to relate to one of our stories. I, I personally grew up in a German Baptist church. So if you had an angry preacher, try preaching angry in German. It's worse. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and you got all that. Anyway, I'm just saying it's true. Um but in, in that world, I, I, I saw the love of God in some ways, provided I towed the line. So there were many times, because I was a good follower, I would follow rules. Uh, now, they would say I didn't. But anyway, I, I, I knew how to follow rules. And I, I just authentically, deep down, knew God loved me. And I had a love for God that was really real, but I'm in this German Baptist church and, and I thought they were bad. And then I went to a Pentecostal church and it was just the same legalism, just a different kind. And so there was so much performance based acceptance. So my faulty image of God mm. was the performance based acceptance. God, the one who if I'm good, he's near. And when I'm bad, he's far. So it's dependent on me. And so everything's dependent <laughs> on me. Yeah, near, far. That's the Grover thing, the Grover effect. I, I talked about that on Sunday. Um, but but it's so true. And so even, and I still heard an angry God, angry against anybody who does bad things. So that's where my angry God picture came in. But I was I was I was in the in crowd still. At least I hoped I was. If I got forgiven fast enough. So there's a lot of guilt and fear attached to it. I didn't have the God's really ticked off image of you. I'm just I'm realizing as I'm saying this to you guys, I'm I'm because I heard you all now. Now I'm narrowing in what it was that I had. I haven't done this ever before to articulate what kind of God I believed in, in my false concept. This is actually quite therapeutic. Um, but to see and articulate that, um, it's helpful because that shows me why I'm so hell-bent on uh, dealing with these issues in the modern church because there, there are stories that are all overlapping. You know, they're, they're overlapping. Like Most people that are listening to this, they have a similar background. Very few have Richard's background where they find Jesus later or wake up to Jesus later. So that, that's a real blessing. 
So anyway, that's that's kind of the world I was in. I wanted to please God. And the best way to please God in the world I grew up in, you, you got to have the best positions. You got well, the uh, Sunday school teacher or be a preacher. That's like that is the place to go or a missionary. Missionary. Then, oh, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. Yeah. But women had to be missionaries because it could be preachers. It was terrible. Like the <laughs> brutal, brutal, stupid rules. The legalism has has just decimated a concept of God that um, how, how can you believe in an all accepting God? And so one of the big verses that I never read before was when Peter it was it revealed to him that I'm not to call anyone unclean or unholy. That was a huge wake up call. And I've already been growing in grace. So that one was like another click. The wheel keeps clicking, you know, the it's getting more and more into focus. So anyway, that's, yeah. that's mine. I'd share a story real quick. Yeah. It, it, just a little story. And, and because it, when he was talking that this kind of like where you said therapeutic, it came up and um, where do I send the bill? I mean, <laughs> 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 I was, uh, I was like 15 years old and I was a bus captain. So I went out every Saturday and, and visited for two or three hours. And then on Sunday we picked up 30, 40, sometimes 50 kids in horrific mm. buses. Anyway, we had uh, one. <laughs> story. Uh, um, uh, a revival and uh, I'm a sports uh, nut. I couldn't, couldn't I tell. Love couldn't it. tell. Yeah. It's hard. to. <laughs> tell. Uh, it's the only clothes I wear. It, it, Anyway, uh, I stayed home uh, a Tuesday night, one of the nights of the the revival, to watch a, a baseball playoff game. And I'll never forget this is a true story. The pastor and the evangelist came over afterwards to my house, mm -hmm. 15 years old. And I remember I, I, they sent me into the front room and took my bus captain and junior church. I preached in junior church some. They took all that away from me. Wow. Because of the... Uh, not putting God first and the church first. And I couldn't hold a position like that and uh, crushed me. Wow. It crushed me because they let me know how disappointed God was in me and they are the authority. And when you're fundamental Baptist, the, those guys are the authority. They know nothing I could feel or uh, at 15 could override that. Mm -hmm. And that's wow. that man, you carry that stuff with you. And I, I would dare say that you mentioned in, when you were describing your image of God that you had originally had, that he was a disappointed God standing there with his arms folded. And I would dare say that part, at least part of that image came from that situation. Uh, and I can even in, in my mind imagine these guys standing there with their arms folded uh, yeah. in disappointment. Yeah, so you're talking therapy. It's it's the, so much of the same stuff. And, you know, I, I grew up, I wasn't allowed to watch He-Man because he would pledge his power to Gray Skull, <laughs> right? In, in, the, in a cartoon and a kid's. So that was like off limits. Like, you know, anything with magic or yeah, we weren't allowed to watch Smurfs because of that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Smurfs was yeah, that was on the border. And uh, I, I remember my mom said, you know, you got to have that red flag that would tell you you're doing something wrong going off. Your red flag, your red flag would go off. You're, you're that sense of guilt, that sense of condemnation is going off. And right, that's that Holy Spirit connected this to us. That Holy Spirit's starting to whack you on the head. And here's the reality. I think Holy Spirit absolutely does guide us into wisdom or non-wisdom, but there's not judgment against it. And that's the difference, right? right? The difference so what's, is... What's, what's the proper translation of the word convict then? It's not convict. I don't think convict Convinced. is the right word. Convince. 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 That's right. That's correct. Right. And so the Holy Spirit convinces us one way or another and, and gives us. And, and then when we make the wrong decision, which guilty a lot of times, right, there's not judgment of this anger against it. It's OK, let's correct. Let's grow. Um, I think that's a much healthier way of understanding how God operates. It's it's we heal and we grow. Right. We are we're not just hammered over the head with some sort of, you know, hammer of justice. So mm -hmm. let me ask each of you, what was a major turning point uh, for the beginning of your healing? What, or what was one key thought, event, or verse that God revealed to you 
that gave you a springboard to, wow, I knew there was a better perspective. And usually each of us has one or two. So which ones hit you? Well, for, for me, uh, a good Christian um, friend, therapist, introduced me in, in just helping me deal with my own crap, which came from all of that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, uh, it was a book, and um, that book, He Loves Me, Loves Me Not, Wayne Jacobson. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty simple book. But for somebody from my background, it, it was amazing. Mm. And uh, uh, the, the, to be, you know, for me, the idea of the cross, that, I mean, mm. that, 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 that God wasn't angry, poor, you know, turned his back on Jesus and, and Jesus was saving us from the Father. That whole like, concept, <laughs> that whole idea began to just, things began to unravel for me. And man, once it started, once it started, and it's still happening. It's yes. wonderful. Yeah. Wow. I I concur with, with what you said there, Fred. It was a really the, the turning point for me. I and maybe I was a little bit beyond the turning point when, when this happened, but this is really where the fuel kicked in. And I really my journey started to really pick up speed was uh, I was at a I was at a point. And I don't remember what the circumstances were going on in my life. I was, I had been a believer now for 20 years or so. And um, I, I was fighting, I was, you know, kicking against this draw. The church I was in for those first 20 years, which was at, at first they were, they were, they, there was a church that believed very strongly that God was a good God. Now they still had their issues, but at least they believed that he was generally good. Well, they suddenly went Calvinist. Um, almost overnight, the pastor just wow. decided this is where we're going. And uh, and man, I there was a struggle in me, a very, very difficult struggle in me that lasted about five years until I just finally broke away. But one of the breaking points was a a book. I was I was having dinner with uh, some friends, uh, and and uh, he had brought with him a book just to give me. He had no idea anything was going on. We didn't go to the same church, and he didn't know what was going on in me, the things I was thinking. Um, but he handed me a book by Greg Boyd called Is God to Blame? Hmm. And uh, the book just opened my eyes to a whole new world of, of understanding the Father. And Fred, something you say all the time, that God looks just like Jesus. I, I, it was like it was so plain. I read it in that book, and it was like, how did I not see that? How did I not see that? And it really, that book fueled, you know, my journey from that point forward has, has been amazing. And I, you know, it's from really from that point that I've made up my mind, I, I want to, I want to help other people in their journeys as well. By uh, one of my most important first books on this journey was classic Christianity by Bob George. Um, and for me, it was, because forgiveness for me, I wanted to please God so bad, but I did not know I was forgiven. I kept begging for what was already mine, and his book launched it. Then I read Grace Walk, and that led to a whole slew of other categories uh, of, of a journey. And we're not done, but the classic Christianity, forgiveness, somehow that kind of really changed a lot in me. So, yeah, I get it. Book Certain books really hit. You know, you know, I would encourage people to write down the books that y'all have mentioned. I'm you know, going to have them on the program. I'm going to have them listed when we air this. I actually brought a book with me that I wanted to recommend. I posted this. Uh, this is a fantastic little book. It's called Healing Our Image of God, which is why. Oh, I brother. It oh, that's why it's familiar. It's a plug. <laughs> yeah. I Look knew, how thin this is. I knew this I'd is seen it. Book. I, I, I bought this, I think, back probably 1995, 96, something like that. In a, in a used bookstore. And I thought I had found the mother load when I, when I started reading it. Uh, and, you know, and for people who, who might need an audio, who, if you'd like to hear some teaching on this, to reinforce the things we're talking about, you know, I've done 20 hours on, on the website, The Goodness of God, that, you know, I did that 20 years ago, but those things still hold up and they're good. It's a good place to begin where we address the tough questions. Uh, and it's on the goodness of God dot com. Uh, but a lot of what some of what I share there comes from this little book. 
Uh, I was already in that direction, but this was this is a this is a, amazing because it, there's illustrations in it that look that that children would like. All right, but and yet it cites all sorts of treatises in here from famous theologians. I've never seen anything so mixed in a wonderful <laughs> way uh, as this is. And if uh, so, I would recommend if you can order this. This is a this family is Catholic that wrote this book, uh, but they've written several you know healing books, inner healing, outer healing, all the healing our image of God. The, the the name of it is Good Goats. You know, talking about the obviously the judgment parable, but listen to some of these topics. And I, I would uh, everyone that's ever read this book that I've recommended it to has come back and praised God for it. Uh, but listen to this: uh, uh, healing our image of God, part one. Uh, chap, the first chapter is good old Uncle George. That's a story. But why wasn't I healed? Is chapter two. We become like the God we adore. Chapter three. How my image of God changed. Chapter four. God loves us at least as much as the person who loves us the most. Mm. That's chapter five. And that's an incredible thing that mm. God loves us at, at least as much as the one in our lives who loves us the most. And he tells a great, uh, they tell a great story in there about how mothers whose son committed suicide thought he was going to be in hell. And then they, they said, well, what would you do if you were in the room with him? He, he was in hell right now, surrounded by the judgment of God. I would go cover him and cover him up and protect him. You know, and it just 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 common sense thing, you know, like knife through butter. What about vengeful punishment in scripture? In scripture, uh, next chapter, Jesus's response to vengeful punishment. The next chapter, reading vengeful punishment passages literally can drive us crazy. Boy, that's true. Uh, and then uh, God's uh, the next chapter, God's twenty thousand year pout. And then this next one is good. Is God a prosecuting attorney or a defense attorney? Yeah, you would like that. I would like that. That's exactly <laughs> right. And, and and I would also say that's helped me being a defense attorney because I I see how how process you know people that do nothing but prosecute who orient all things through prosecution how it changes their countenance how it hardens mm -hmm. their heart. I, I posted today about the law versus the spirit and how the law uh, uh, electrocutes and the spirit electrifies like the, the difference that's between the two of them, and that changes everything when we don't have that fear of wrath and that fear of condom that changes everything and bill you said it so well earlier when you were talking about that you know waiting for that 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 the hammer to drop you know that it affects and, and we become feverish you know we're feverish with that but when that fear is gone and we know we no longer operate from that our consciences then become undefiled that's a defiled conscience you know and like you were saying bill some people define that as the conscience it's not that's a defiled conscience that, that yeah. operates in fear an undefiled conscience, you know, remember we looked at that word a couple of weeks ago and it means to, to co-perceive your conscience, your undefiled conscience co-perceives things. God is teaching you to perceive him and her, mm -hmm. you know, teaching you. And then you're perceiving things together, which is the best of all worlds. But uh, how being loved and forgiven as an unrepentant sinner healed me. Does God send anyone to hell? What about the hell of suffering? Jesus came to be with us in hell. What about free will, the seed of God? God is a father. More than that, God is a mother. Why is it so important to change our image of God? Does fear of hell cause addiction and negative behavior? Punishment never heals. Only love can heal. We are all good ghosts. And then the last one is a simple way to change our image of God. And then it's got questions and answers in the back. Can you believe that? This wow. I swear I have but, that on my bookshelf. I, I'm yeah. certain I have it. Yeah, yeah. Well, wow. it's a good one in kids. Like I said, you can tone it down with kids and read some of it. And, you know, some of the it, it's uh, it's wonderful. But listen, there's so many books out there. I, I'd recommend another one by C.S. Cowles. Um, he, he, he's no you know, he's been promoted with the Lord, but uh, he's a Nazarene theologian. And it was uh, uh, about the character of God, he, uh, you know, uh, understanding the character of God revealed in Christ. Wow. It's a little book. It's a thin book, too. That Ooh, that wow. one's. That was a fantastic one. So my, my whole thing is, I mean, is, is just that we share resources and, and, and to give people resources to tap into because they may like different writers, different, different things, but there's so many writers out there. Greg Boyd, he has a huge one. He was huge in my walk. And, um, um, you know, there are so many resources out there though. That, and this has always been the case. There's resources in the early fathers and mothers and of the early church. 
they didn't they didn't take this though it was the latin church that got this wrathful image of god and that was because they were on on in rome they were on the on the pulse of empire that was power poor augustine was getting rinsed left and right you know to try to get his theology to line up with uh you know the power of rome and whereas the eastern fathers who weren't militaristic they they you know the majority of them are the ones that really conveyed this fatherly motherly you know loving image of a non-condemning god and, and even they got you know affected some later but this 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 goes way back and y'all know this but i mean this goes way back to the beginning this isn't just something this generation has come up with there's been a there's been a contingent in every generation that have seen the things we've seen in their own vernacular you know in their own emotional circumstances and um and just one last thing i'd say is is uh you know paul young in, in in the shack talks about the great pain you know how mac in that book had to deal with the great pain in his life and really we each have a great pain and it's different from different ones of us you know but that's where in, in the movie the shack we're talking about in the movie the shack you know wisdom and this this broke this both broke and fixed my heart when i saw this image from the movie but in the movie mac whose whose child's been killed by a serial killer and he's so angry at god and he's wrestling with God during the entire movie about the, the death of his child. Well, he meets wisdom in a cave and wisdom is, is a woman. And wisdom is on the throne sitting in the cave while he's pouring out his heart. And then he just, he falls down on his knees in anguish about the loss and about his pain. And she gets down from the, she gets down from her throne, down with him in the dirt and just starts stroking him. And I'm telling you, we we've been taught a God that doesn't get down with us in the dirt, you know, where we're at. But that's that that is Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that, those are the images, you know, that we, that we can that we can carry and share with others. that will change everything. And you you just took my book. <laughs> you just, <laughs> I was going to say uh, my book was The Shack uh, and it goes back 15 or so years ago. Probably two things happened that kind of uh, and within proximity, one another, I started attending a different church, and um, the first sermon I heard there, it it for a person that grew up from before birth in the womb in church, right, whose whose entire history, even prior to birth, was consumed within the church, and then therefore after, to hear something completely earth shattering in a message is hard to do in a 30 minute sermon. Right. And yet that happened for me. And that the simple point was the trees in the garden, the two trees in the garden were the entire filter for how we should interpret scripture. Mm. And that there is, there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil and a tree of life and the tree of life is a representative of Christ. And that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is interpreted by most people. And we we kind of just gloss over that story and we move on, but that it's interpreted as the bad tree. And, you know, you, but it's not, it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, like doing, doing good and thinking good, thinking that doing good makes you good is just as bad as doing bad and thinking that bad makes you bad. Yeah, that's, that's mind bending when you've been taught that, just like you had said, Mike, uh, the, the parent, you know, the performance indicators, like if I'm doing good, that makes me good. No, doing good and thinking that makes you good. If you go through the words of Jesus, all of a sudden the words of Jesus start clicking because he goes after the people doing perceptible good way more harshly than he does the people doing bad and being perceived as bad. So both are are. are both are from a tree that poisons and toxins our soul, toxins our soul, right? And that we have to go to a tree of grace where it's not what I do that defines me, but who I am made in the image of and who I'm loved by that defines me. That combined with reading the shack, which kind of lays that out in a narrative form as opposed to maybe, you know, a story form as opposed to maybe a, a theological form. Um, you know, it is a book that, prior to the movie that you have to get through the first third of it. And if you, you got to kind of 
suck it up to get through the first third of that book because it is so dark and so painful and so heavy. But then it starts to address topics and questions that I think everybody struggles with. And it's interesting how many people I know that have read it who who haven't picked up on some of the most deeply, you know, um, uh, re reforming ideas in that book. <laughs> <laughs> they read and they're like, yeah, I love the book going, what'd you think about this? And they're like, oh, that's in there. And it's like, yes. And it, so I think that was one of the books I, I kind of picked up on a lot of those things. And it really hyper spun me into this understanding of God being exactly like Jesus. Mm. And, and yeah, it's I a movie it, too. It's a movie. And it too. is a movie uh, now. Yes. Uh, uh, we, and the movie's on. fantastic. In fact, I, I got more from the movie just personally me, cause I'm a visual, you know, learner. Uh, but uh, yeah, the movie's fantastic. Yeah, book was Everybody's better. Movie was good because I I am also visual, um, but it hit my heart and soul deep. Fred, yeah, let me let me pick back on that and and let me contrast a couple of books <laughs> that I think uh, the religious world they they both are incredible sellers. So, um, and I highly respect Rick Warren. I do. Uh, he, he, the way he conducts himself is, uh, he, he seems like a spirit filled guy to me. I, again, we wouldn't agree today, but I did it then. And, and I really promoted the purpose driven life. I just thought, man, this is the book every Christian needs to read. Yep, me too. But it, it is the mixture of, uh, of grace and, and law. Performance. It, it, it is the performance. That's why it resonated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did too. Uh, the shack. So, um, healing my image of God, it, it, the shack helped me get out of formulaic, um, learning about God with this precept upon precept upon precept and this line upon line upon line. And all of a sudden with the shack, the movie also was, yeah, that took it to a whole new level, but there was a beauty in God. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, poetry, beauty, yes, touch the heart that like nothing else I've ever seen in the church world. And so I, I've got these two books and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's this one is the one that's capturing. It's the one that's speaking deep into my heart. It's the one that's making me actually leap for joy as I read and cry. And uh, the Holy Spirit, gathering our tears in the garden. Mm -hmm. I mean, Oh my goodness. There, it, it, it was amazing. And so that's what, for me, I did two messages. It's the most viewed messages I've ever done called attack on the shack. I was trying to introduce my congregation to, this is a vision of God that we need. And uh, I did those two messages. And, um, well, I ran 600 people off in about a month and a half. Wow. Um, that's a lot. I remember, listen, when Purpose Driven came out, and as a pastor, I loved the formulas. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, these are the purposes of the church. But as I started to grow in grace, I couldn't throw away something. So I put it on the back burner. So what is it? I didn't want to toss it all out. And I finally came to realize that those five purposes are not the purposes of the church. They are the five overflows of what an abiding believer looks like anyway. You don't tell them to do it. It's not performance. It's yeah. these, that's, this is what grace is going to look it's like. Response. It's our response. This is yeah. what we're going to fellowship with us. We're going to share the love of Christ. We're going to serve each other. It doesn't have to be in church. Like we're going to do these things because that's what life in us does instead of a prescription, which is controlled. That's how I saw it. Anyway, you know, uh, I, I, um, I've, I've shared this before, but I, I had a, uh, a dream one time, a dream slash vision. I'm still not sure exactly what it was because I was in twilight sleep, but it was a dream at the same time. But, but it was basically that I, I, I saw God and God was in samurai armor. And I don't know how I knew it was God, but I knew it was God. And then, but then I went up and I pulled the samurai armor off because I knew that wasn't accurate. I knew that that wasn't a, an accurate shape of God. And then underneath, it was a knight's armor underneath the samurai armor. But th that wasn't right either. And I kept stripping off layers. And then ultimately, God was revealed as uh, a muscular shepherd. But then mm -hmm. even in the wake of that, 
it was quickened to me. That's that's the, that that's the projection too. Even though it's more true to form, yeah. but it, in all that 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 set my my whole mindset that to understand that a lot of wrong thinking about God comes from what we project onto Him from ourselves. We're we're wrathful. We're fearful. We're yes. we're condemning those things, and they become toxically addictive to us. So we, you know, we project those things onto God without being conscious. It's almost a psychological thing. So when we deal, you know, we talked about not being indoctrinated. And he, you do that by listening to good teaching. All right, that's one way to do it. And listening to good stories, listening to good experiences. But in terms of dealing with our own great pain and our own insecurity, you know, everyone has to deal and ask themselves, am I projecting what I just said onto God? Mm -hmm. Because I will be honest with you. I have never felt the anger of God. I have been angry and then projected anger onto God, but I've never, when I, whenever I could tell you that I am tuned in, that I feel tuned in spiritually to what's going on, I've never seen God. I've never felt God. I've never sensed God. I've never heard God be angry. I've, I've, I, there have been times when I knew he wasn't approving of where I was and what I was doing, but, it, but he was there. There was an abiding presence and it was still like he was waiting for me you know, uh, uh, calling me, you know, but, 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 but being quiet, not saying anything because he knew I wasn't going to listen, but he was still there. And I can't tell you how much that's meant to me through many tumultuous, you know, events in my life to, to have that view of God, never condemning, not one second, was there any condemnation coming from him? And I think that it's, it's the great self policing of our, of our thought life that we, that we, we have the courage to acknowledge that I projected when we see unworthiness projected onto God or reactive anger or hate or disgust or oppression or any of those things that we, we say someone is projecting in this on the God that may be me projecting it. It may be something I've been taught that's projecting and it may be a hive mind that I'm a part of this projecting it, but that is not the God. The real God is underneath the armor and the armor of God. When you pull it off is Jesus. We know that. I mean, that, that, that he's the Rosetta stone for the whole thing. So anyway, that's a good metaphor, I think, to help us be willing to check our own eye and be willing to be willing to confess to yourself, just to yourself, that what that nasty thought about God or that indifferent thought about God or that, you know, that God's nowhere to be found in this thing. Those thoughts are are our projections. It's not it's not the God who reveals himself through Jesus, who came and co-suffered and died and resurrected and all this thing to, that he can live in us, you know, uh, all the, you know, it's just the, that intimacy, that level of intimacy. Uh, but it's these projections that keep us. And, and you know, we've shared this before, but Tozer, A.W. Tozer said, we grow to resemble by a secret law of the soul. We grow to resemble our image of God. So when we talk about today about healing our image of God, it's so that we can grow into his likeness mm, and that we right. can be as he is. Because it says when we finally see Jesus, we shall be like him. <laughs> you know, that's an exciting thing. But this wrath, these these uh, project this armor, these different types of armor we're projecting on the God. That's we have to deal with those as individuals. Yeah. So that yeah, that's cool. I like that one verse that uh, people use that the whole you know God's going to convict you of sin. Well, that big wonderful verse says nothing about people being convicted of their sin. It's convicted of their unbelief. Very different. Oh, and so, good. that's good. Oh, yeah, it's true. But people yeah. wouldn't believe me. So one Sunday at the, and the end, word is actually enlightened is if you go to the yeah. actual word, it's it's yeah. not supposed to be convicted. It's enlightened into their unbelief, right? Yep. Yeah. I had a good mm -hmm. pastor scholar guy sitting in the congregation. So at the end of the service, I said, okay, for this verse, go home. And we're going to talk about this next week. Look it up and find out who is being convicted or convinced, find out what the word convict means, and what are they be convicted of? That guy came back next Sunday with a different joyous look on his face. I expected yep. the opposite. And I, I had a great message that day, but it was, people <laughs> forget, though God does not convict us of sin or is angry with us. And it's like, wow. Well, pretty cool. Amen. Well, Good stuff. Go ahead, Fred. Well, we don't have time in this uh, to discuss it, but one of the things that once you, you began down this path, for me personally, because of biblicism, because of, of the way I was taught to read the Bible and the way I taught people to read mm -hmm. the Bible, now all of a sudden are these, yeah, but 
but what about what about yeah. what about this person? So yep. somewhere for people who are listening, we we might need to say to help heal the image of God. Yep. There is a way to read the Bible that will help you heal the image of God. Yes. Maybe, maybe we make that part two. Oh, that'd be great. Okay. All right. We got to wrap up because time is done, but this has been really a good conversation. I actually got to know each of you just a, a little bit better, just a different, there's a, something I just didn't know. And this is, it's fun. Just continue on like this. All right. We'll catch you guys next time. And hopefully we can continue this conversation and do part two with what Fred just talked about. So uh, until then, we'll catch y'all later. Wow, that was fun. Oh my goodness. If you only jumped in partway through the conversation, you got to go back to the beginning. This is this was a really good one. In fact, I have a hunch many are going to resonate with the different stories. And I really valued Richard's uh, background concept of who he thought God was, not coming from the church world, where Fred and I both came from a church world. Like, I think Fred's Fred and I, I don't know Fred very well yet, um, but I tell you, I think we have a lot more in common than I ever thought. Um, I loved it. It was really good. Uh, thank you to those that are chiming in. Marty Davis, good morning. Phil Lawson, Jim Willard in Florida. Jennifer Marshall. Hey, Jennifer, thanks for saying hi on Sunday morning as well. For those that don't know, I, I go live every Sunday, and the Sunday messages are are a little bit different than what we cover here on Wednesday mornings. Wednesday mornings, we get into some pretty deep stuff, stuff that I can't cover at church. So uh, this, th it's like having two different ways of, of covering different topics, and I, I really like it. A rainy good morning down in Alabama, um, and I think that's it for this morning. And I see other people watching but not commenting, which is great. I hope you enjoyed that. And we are going to cover next week, and we're going to follow up with what Fred had said about biblicism and how our concept of the scriptures really hinders our concept of who we think God is. So that'll be really good. I know, Phil, you were asking, or you made a comment about forgiveness, and uh, we are going to cover that a little bit more. We've done a conference on forgiveness. I've taught on the whole understanding what forgiveness is and is not. And in that conference and in those materials, I cover the very topic you asked about of, is everyone really forgiven? And there's a fantastic case to be made. Uh, and even those verses you m mentioned there, there's a deeper meaning to them than you think. And I, I was never told. That's why it blew my mind. So anyway, I'm looking forward to sharing more of that with you. And I hope you can tag along and, and uh, ride this journey with us. So we're still learning, unlearning, and discovering a better, more hope-filled perspective on who God is. So thanks for joining us this week. And we look forward to next week because we are going to cover what Fred talked about. Until then, have a great week. If you enjoyed this, share it. If you value what's going on here, please support it. Uh, we could use some. Thanks. See ya. Join me next time on Still Growing in Grace for more good news. Enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca. You can also visit hopefellowshipycc.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, please consider making a donation today at growingingrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace.